In this video, we're going to be setting up logging for Unicorn and Supervisor. And the reason we're doing this is so that we can see what's happening in our application when it's running. So we're going to be setting up um, three different log files. We're going to have the Supervisor log file, so we can see when Supervisor is starting and stopping processes. And this will let us know, for example, when um, there's a bug or error in our code or Unicorn, and Unicorn sort of flaps on and off and on and off and on and off. It gives us a record of that, which is important. Um, the other log file we're going to have is the Unicorn Access log. So that's going to give us a record of the web traffic coming into our server. Um, it's going to tell us things like what paths are people visiting, what browsers are they using, what status codes do they get in return. That's really useful for debugging. And it's also just useful to see sometimes um, things like who visited our site. Uh, for example, I used to spend a lot of time looking at Googlebot visiting various parts of um, websites at work and making sure that Googlebot could get around the website. So our access logs are quite useful. And finally, we're going to have some application logs. Um, we're going to do a pretty crude implementation of this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take unicorn errors, things like unicorn starting, stopping, crashing, in addition to our Django logs, uh, Django errors, Django information logs, and we're just going to stuff it all into one file and call it our app log, which is a uh, crude but mostly works and you know we're going to keep it simple and not make it too fancy for now. So that's it and uh, we can do all of this just through pure configuration. It'll be very similar to the last video where we configured Unicorn. We're just going to tweak some config files, deploy those, restart Supervisor D and watch our logs um, start rolling in. So let's get to it. Um, so I've got my Unicorn configuration file, my Supervisor D configuration file, and um, I'm just going to add some config. And once again, I'll just show you where I looked for find how to do this. I went to the uh, supervisor log, uh, supervisor documentation, looked under the supervisor D section and found the log file. And you can see they just want you to set log file equals some path. So that was pretty easy. Um, for Unicorn, I've uh, used logging in Unicorn couple of times before, so I'm sort of a bit more familiar with it, but I still just went and checked the name of all the things I had to set, like access log and error log and log level and all that stuff. So let us uh, give it a crack. Let's start with supervisor, probably the simplest one. So when we do this, um, Actually, I want to double check this now that I didn't screw this up. They say under supervisor D log file equals wherever. Cool. So I am going to propose that we put our log file in our app directory, which may be a controversial decision. I don't know. We're going to make a folder called logs. And like our database, this logs folder um, is just going to live on the server. It's not going to exist on our local uh, Django project, and we're not going to delete this ever. We might sort of retire all log files, but we're not going to sort of delete this when we deploy. So in app logs, uh, we'll give it a nice name, and I think supervisor d.log is as good as any. All right. So currently, there is a log file that I think by default supervisor d has dumped in uh, app supervisor d.log. I didn't like that because it was sort of just junking up that main directory and I prefer it got put in its own logs folder. So this is just a bit of tidying up and I'll just delete this log file later on. Cool, that was pretty straightforward. And let's look at our Unicorn, Unicorn configuration, which is a little more complicated. So let's go into here. Let's start with our access log. This is a record of all the incoming HTTP requests and some nice sort of information about that, which is quite useful. And we're going to put it in app logs unicorn.access.log. And you can call this whatever you want, but this seems like a good name to me. Um, there is then what we're going to call the... So in Unicorn's configuration, they call it the error log because it's where Unicorn uh, starting and stopping and the errors go. Um, I actually think the way that it's being used in this setup is actually an application log. So I'm going to call it app log. And once again, you can call this you know, the wizard log or the, the Harry log or the Susan log and it's whatever the fuck you want. But 
I think application log describes it nicely. Cool. Um, so there's this setting called capture output. Um, and what this does is, well, let's look at the docs and why am I just going to make up some bullshit when we can look at their official redirect standard out and standard error to the specified file in error log. So um, when Unicorn is running Django, if you haven't configured any Django um, log settings, uh, which I discuss in sort of a different um, blog post. Things like exceptions and stuff are just going to get printed to standard out or standard error. And um, by default, I think Unicorn just throws them away or tries to print them to the screen, but because it's running in supervised D, there is no screen. So what we're telling it to do here is when Django throws an error or has some uh, print message or something that it's sort of printing out to the screen, um, this is going to capture that and put it in our application log file. And uh, because we want something simple that's, uh, you know, not too, uh, without too many moving pieces, we're just going to capture the output and stuff it in this error log, which is what this setting does. Um, finally, there's the log level. Um, this is basically like how much information do we want Unicorn to print? And uh, the options are like only print errors, only, you know, only print errors, print warnings or errors, print information, warnings or errors, print debug statements, information, warnings or errors. And we don't want debug statements, but info is good. So we're going to set it to info. Um, cool. That is our Unicorn config. Now we're good to deploy it. Um, I'm just going to check I spelled everything right. App logs, app logs. Didn't leave off an S somewhere like I have a million times. Logs all looks good. Sweet. Let us deploy this. So same as before. Let's nuke our local deploy directory. Let's, I wonder if I had this already. So I'm just using up down key to cycle through previous commands because I reckon I've already done this before. There we go. SSH root user attitude server remove like nuke the root deploy folder recursively force. So the force parameter in Linux often means something like uh, try to do this no matter what, even if it doesn't exist. So without the R, so without the F, if we did this, um, and deploy didn't exist, it would throw an error. But with the F, it just doesn't throw an error if it's not there. Okay, that's done. And we're going to do a secure copy recursively, which means uh, copy this folder and all of its contents from our deploy folder to root at tute server as the root user onto tute server to the folder root. And I think the thing I forgot to do was to copy our config folder into our deploy folder. Indeed, I think I need to make the deploy folder first, copy the config into the deploy folder, and then we can do our copy. And this is what you get for being lazy. Okay. And it's copied over our new config files. Let's jump onto the server with SSH. Pop in a control L to clear the screen, which is nice. Let's jump into our deploy folder, which is in root deploy. And there's the config folder that we just uploaded. Use CD to get in there. And then we'll use DOS to Unix to get rid of those pesky line endings. So I, last time I used dot slash, which means uh, basically dot is this working directory slash means sort of uh, like a file folder path separator and star means everything. I'm just going to try star, see if that works. So dos to Unix, everything. Yeah, that works. All done. Okay, let's remove the config folder in our app directory. Let's copy over this deployed. Oh, wait a second. Go back one. So um, if dot is this current working directory, dot dot is the parent. So if we're in config now, dot dot is deploy. So this will change directory into deploy. You can see that worked. And in fact, 
we can do cd dot dot slash dot dot. This will do the parent of the parent, which will be the uh, our home directory. You can see that works as well. Anyway, enough of that. Let's copy recursively from our config folder to the app folder. And we should be able to see in our app folder now that our config's copied. CD app. And just for shits and gigs, I'll cat out a config just for the conf to make sure that it all is set up the way we want it. It's got our log file here now. That should all work. Cool. And uh, as before, we need to activate our virtual environment to get access to supervisor CTL. And I think actually what I should do is use this superscript instead because that uses the right config file. Um, so in scripts super, we are going to, this is supervisor CTL, by the way, if you recall, this is just a shortcut to use it. Um, we are going to reload supervisor D like we did in the last video. Reload message files directory. Oh, I'm trying to cat this. Whoops. Okay, so we're going to run supervisor CTL. We're going to run the reload command, which will restart supervisor D, re restart G, G unicorn, load the new configuration for both of them, and we should see um, them to start logging into our logs folder. But there's one problem. There's one thing I've neglected to do. And that is I haven't created the logs folder. Now you might think, well, it would be nice if the programs that we just configured created the logs folder for us, and they might, um, but sometimes they don't. And uh, they will just say like, this folder doesn't exist. How the fuck do you expect me to put a file in here into a folder that doesn't exist? And they will crash and we'll feel stupid. But so let's make do logs. So make sure the folder's there first, and then we will reload supervisor D, which will in turn reload G unicorn. And let's hope this all works. I have not tried this before. Oh my God. <clears throat> That's so cool. Let us remove the supervisor D log, the old one. That's uh, just sort of making our app directory look shitty. And uh, let's jump into super into the logs folder. I'll show you a couple of little logging tricks. So as before, we can cat supervisor D.log. You can see that it's run unicorn. We can test this. Yeah, watch that count. Always going higher and higher. It's quite inspiring. Listen to this all. And you can see the unicorn application log. Let's give that a cat as well, see what's in there. And maybe I fucked up by calling it app because as you can see now, when I try to tab it, it's saying, well, do you want access log or app log? And then I have to type a P now, which is she. And you can see it has booted up Unicorn and it will just continue writing the Unicorn logs into here. Um, and if an exception happens in our code, uh, we should expect to see it in here as well, unless I screwed up the configuration somehow. Finally, we've got the Unicorn access logs and I'm pretty excited about these. So I might just zoom out a bit so this is all on one line and I'll go through it with you. So we've got, I believe, the uh, source IP address. I think that's the IP address of my computer. Let me check this with, what's my IP? So IP version six, that's kind of shitty. Whatever, okay. That wasn't very helpful. Um, so I think that's my IP address. I'd be surprised if it wasn't. And on the 25th of April, 2020, and some weird ass server time, uh, a get request was sent to the root path using HTTP 1.1, and it was uh, given back a response code of 200, 200 okay, meaning success. I think this is like the number of bytes that got returned or something, but I have no idea. Um, this is kind of cool. This is the user agent string. This uh, is a string that uniquely identifies my browser, Chrome 81.0. And you can see it's actually not like, it doesn't just say this version of Chrome. It's got all this random shit that doesn't make any sense, like Safari, which isn't 
put Mac thing. Um, it's pretty normal for user agent st strings, but sometimes they'll say things like Googlebot, which means that Google is scraping your site. So it's useful to see this. Um, you can also see a get request being made for the CSS um, and 304 means like, I think hasn't changed. So you can use your cached version. Uh, this is just like our run server logs from before when we were running it locally. And you can use this information to uh, understand what's happening on your site, who's trying to access it and debug problems. And one other thing I want to show you is that this log will change over time. So if we um, just like load the site a bunch more times, let's do a hard reload. So we get our styles.css again. And let's look back at the access logs. Okay. Uh, Chrome, when it hard reloaded, tried to get the fav icon, which it always does, and it's not there, so it got a 404. Tried to reload the styles, and it was there, so it got a 200. Okay. And it tried to reload the root of the page. Um, it's kind of shitty, though, like having to print all of the logs over and over again. Um, you, you often only care about the most recent logs, but using cat, it will print the whole file, and if the file is very long, that's a lot of scrolling. So there is this cool tool called tail. Um, what was it? Check on access logs. Access log. So tail prints, I think by default, the last 10 lines. And this means that even if you have a very long file, you can just tail it and get the uh, last 10 lines. And I guess for completeness, I'll also show you head, which prints the first 10 lines, I believe. 10, maybe it's eight, I don't know. Right, so that's cool. That helps us with very long files. But wait, there's more. So you can set how many uh, lines you want to print. Let's say I want to see the last 10 lines, which is cool. Maybe you want to see more than 10, maybe you want to see 100. But wait, there's more. With the dash F parameter or argument or flag or whatever you want to call it, this will follow the log file. So what this means is that tail will keep running until you exit with control C and it will uh, wait until new uh, lines are written to the file and then it'll print those to the screen, which means you can do this, right? So you can see I haven't exited tail to my bash terminal. It's still running the tail program. Let's go here. Let's start hitting the website. And as you can see, new log messages being written are now being picked up by tail and printed to the screen. So you can actually follow traffic on your website in real time using tail. And you can do the same thing with um, uh, all the other logs. You can do it with the uh, unicorn app logs, the supervisor logs, whatever you want, you can tail them. And so that's quite a useful little um, technique just to watch your logs happening in real time. Okay, there you go. Exit with control C. Our application is now writing logs to the server. Um, there's even more stuff you can do with this by splitting out the Django logs and uh, even shipping the logs off of the server onto your own um, sort of centralized logging platform, which will allow you to search them and visualize them without having to log in to a server, which is pretty cool. But this is enough for now. Now when there's an error with your app or you want to know something about its behavior, you can log in to the server with SSH and dig around in the logs folder to figure out what happened, um, which is pretty cool. So that is it for our um, Supervisor D and Unicorn configuration. If you want to tweak it a bit more, feel free to have an experiment. The next thing we're going to do is learn how to automate the whole process that we've just done so that we never have to write um, all these commands again manually because that would suck. <laughs>